So, hey, Kim, welcome to the show, man. Um, you know, we have been talking about getting together during this whole quarantine. Uh, this is a new way of working for everybody. I mean, we're all at home. People are getting to see our home offices. Uh, I, I mean, I'm looking at you right now. You're going against Big Cat Williams, and you talked about that a little bit. Just tell, tell us about the evolution of Kevin Carter from Florida to the league to now the philanthropist that you are. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know you're a great R&B singer. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, just tell us about, I mean, because Florida as a school now is so different Yeah, than it was then. You guys were what Alabama was doing as far as winning SEC championships and uh, Steve Spurrier. Tell us a little bit about your time at Florida and, and that experience to get you to the NFL. Well, first of all, being at Florida um, during that time, that was kind of the, the golden age of Florida football. Um, you know, you, you had a bunch of great players, guys like Emmett Smith and Huey Richardson, you know, Trace Armstrong. You had a bunch of great players that came out of the program, the Lewis Olivers of the world, the guys yeah. that, you know, that on Sunday they ball out. But, you know, Florida as a program didn't have the, the program success that an Alabama or Georgia had, you know. They, hadn't, they didn't have the national championships by their name. They didn't have countless – SEC championships, you know, by their name. And it just wasn't that story program. Well, when I got there, man, in, in 91, Steve Spurrier changed everything. He changed the perception of who we were, you know, told us what we were going to do and really set out and, and really did it. I mean, we, we had a lot of talent, but I think it was more, you know, look, we all, I, I always tell my son, we talk about this all the time, you know, there are great players that come from everywhere, but, but what's in your head and what's in your heart and being able to put those things together and, yeah. and get everyone to buy in, you know, that, that yeah. buy in factor that basically everyone believes that their contribution, no matter big or small, is the difference between winning and losing, you know, truly, yeah. to, truly block buy into that. And, and we had that, we had that esprit de corps at Florida and, um, and he was in spur. He was cocky, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, I he coached was, against him in the AF. <laughs> we beat them. Right. And he says they won the championship, but our guys say no. The hot shots are the actual champs. So Spurrier would talk. We, we scrimmaged them, Kevin. And I, and I have that's a whole other story we got to talk about. But I, <laughs> the thing I like about Spurrier as a coach, I would mm -hmm. have played for him because of his attitude. He he, yep. he and since he gives guys an attitude of, hey, we're gonna go out there and kick your butt, and if you don't stop us, we're gonna keep kicking your butt. Yeah, and I, and I needed that personally. I mean, I was you know relatively new to football. Okay. I was a nice, you know, church kid. Yes, you know, yes, ma'am, yeah. no, sir, you know, type thing. And and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't quite get the fact that, you know, football was that one arena, man, that I could just let loose. You know, yeah, and I didn't you're, have, I didn't you're have from to. Tallahassee, so how did Florida State let you get to Gainesville? Now, uh, man, I, I'm no. good to, I mean, I bet you, you were a highly recruited guy, even though you yeah. didn't realize how highly recruited you were. Right. <laughs> well, you know what. I think Florida State thought that I was just – it was just a foregone conclusion that I was going to go there. Oh. I, I, I really did. Not that they didn't recruit me. I mean, they were all over me. Because you were a basketball I, I, guy, I'm sure, playing basketball at the time, right? Uh -huh. A lot of basketball and mm -hmm. kind of into football. Is that is that, that what happened with you? No. I mean, I, I was always a football player. I mean, I, I was just a dunker and a rebounder in basketball. I wasn't <laughs> real skilled. But my thing was, you know, I didn't – I was kind of a late bloomer. You know okay. what I'm saying? It's like okay. when I hit my freshman year, I was in that awkward, you know, baby giraffe stage. And, <laughs> and I, could, I could barely walk and chew bubble gum, you know. Yeah. And it was one of those things as to where, you know, you look at me and you say, either he's going to be a really good athlete or he's going to be a giraffe the rest of his life, you know. What, what got you? Who, who was it or what got you to think, I need to now morph into me? I know your dad is a big influence mm -hmm. to your mom, your dad. Uh, your uncles, but who was it that touched that heart? Because you talk a lot about heart. I know we all have it in our head, but there's somebody that has to link that that degree of separation to make you think I can be special. My mom. Okay. My mom. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, you know, look, yeah. dad was always there and he was supportive. But yeah. when I was when I was in ninth grade, and you know, back then we had you know you had to make the football team and make the teams. Oh, yeah. And oh, uh, yeah. and you know we didn't have that. You know, everybody gets a trophy. For participating yeah. type thing back in them days and so my freshman year man I went to a public high school 
And it, in Lincoln High School in Tallahassee is a big time mm -hmm. program. And I didn't make the team my freshman year. I didn't make the JV football team or JV basketball team my freshman year. And I was, man, I was distraught, yeah. discouraged, okay. and just done. And so I was in marching band my freshman year. Oh, and man. I was, I was in that baby giraffe stage. And then, man, the funny thing happened over the summer. I grew, like, I thought I had mono. Like, the whole summer I slept. <laughs> I, was, I was sickly. I was hurting. And uh, man, it come. It turns out that I grew like seven inches over the summer. Wow! And um, and here I was going from about five foot nine, you know, and kind of sloppy and just you know, long yeah. arms and big feet and everything, and everything was growing but the right things. And then all of a sudden, I came back to school when I was about six three, Ooh. and uh, and just and 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 everything. And so I came out for football like that 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 following spring, and um, and so. And the rest was the rest was sort of history, man. It's like I, I literally took to it like a duck to water, and just got better and better. Yeah. I I, I didn't have any bad habits because I never played. Yeah. yeah. You know. And so yeah. so I, I was I was easy to coach, but but the person that really got it in my heart and let me know, she says, my you know my mom used to tell me she's like, look, you can act like you don't know what you're doing, and you can act like you know you 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 shouldn't have this prize because you haven't played very long. She's like, no one cares if you or if you haven't when you put on that uniform you you just another player mm -hmm. she's like so you better go out there and fake it till you make it you know <laughs> and, and she, she, she was always that person she's like someone's yeah. got to win why not you so i literally yeah. stepped out there man you know about by my senior year you know i was six five you know 230 pounds playing mm -hmm. inside linebacker going sideline to sideline just wreaking yeah. havoc and and here i am had only been on the football field for two years and yeah and so, yeah you know, having having that type of support and that type of belief about you know what you can wrap your mind around, because that's uh -huh. really all we're that's really all we're limited to in this world is is what we can what we can fathom what we, what we can wrap our mind and our heart around achieving. And so yeah. for me, that was it. You know, it's interesting. I'm a mama's boy, and I used to look at that as a negative. But now, as I've gotten older, even the other day when the draft starts, she sends me something about the draft, and I can remember when you would put goals on your wall. Uh, and just the things, my mom was kind of the same influence. I had a lot of great coaches, but mm -hmm. she, that kind of knew how to make me tick. And it sounds like your mother was the same way. It, the other part to this is when you finally realize that you can unleash the beat, beast, right. like you were able to do, and, and not get arrested for it. We talk about that a lot. Between the lines, you can do a lot of things, and that, that, that's good for a, <laughs> a growing up young man. Mm -hmm. Florida. Who was the guy that made you work harder than you had to work in high school? Because that's that next progression. You know, you're you're <laughs> recruit first day. People think, oh, I'm gonna be a star. Somebody is fighting you every day. My my nemesis every day at practice was Marcus Patton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, he fought every day. So yep. who was that guy in Florida that made you better? But you hated him when you first got there. Man, I had a couple of guys. There was one offensive tackle that came in a year after I did. A guy named Jason Odom. And okay. uh, you know, yeah. Jason was a, you know was a high draft pick, played for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But man, he was he was sort of my nemesis. Man, we we went at it as far as players. He he was he was a guy that I went against. But I I think one of the people that really helped me, funny enough, didn't even play opposite of me, like you know against me. But he mm -hmm. was a dude that was you know he, uh, he's his his older brother. It was it was Eric Rett. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Eric Rett, Eric Rett's older brother Mike Rett played fullback for East Carolina. And um, and my older brother played defensive end in East Carolina, and okay. so we met. We you know we met when we were in high school, and uh, and E. Rat man, he was that kind of guy that if he saw something in you, he was gonna go at you so that you know he get it out of you, you know. And when I got <laughs> to Florida, man, he was always saying, you know, man, you know, your brother, man, your brother say you tough, man. I, I got to get it out <laughs> of you, man. You know, we got to, you know, we, we, we got to make sure we're better. Than our big brother's programs up there, yeah, you yeah. know, and he was always going at me. And but we had that type of atmosphere in, at Florida. See, that's what that's what Coach Spurrier created. He created, <coughs> excuse me, he created an environment, man, where we were always constantly competing, competing, yeah, competing, going at each other, making each other better. It wasn't about you know everyone was fighting for their claw for their piece of that mm -hmm. glory, of, of, of that spotlight. And it wasn't a selfish thing. It was just like, you know, man, I'm a win. No, I'm going to win. You know, it was just like we were always going at each <laughs> other. And, and so we had that type of peer pressure 
and practice because the yeah. thing about Coach Furrier that he let you know, it didn't matter what classification you were. If you were good enough, mm -hmm. you were going to play. So yeah. that, that was clear from day one. You had guys that were upperclassmen that had that they got beat out by younger guys. You know, they hadn't paid their yeah. due, weren't there, and he didn't care. He's like, if you get on the field and you do it, then then that's it. And so for me, you know, having Jason Odom, having Eric Rett was good, but from a coaching standpoint, man, it was Charlie Strong. Oh. Charlie Strong, Charlie <laughs> Strong was my position coach when I got to Florida. And okay. people say, you know, coaching trees, how did you become who you are? You know, man, look, we can all go back and trace the, you know, retrace the breadcrumbs, okay? It's not by coincidence, okay? When I say my position coach, the guy that I spent four years with, guy digging in my, you know, you know what, oh, getting all yeah. up in me and challenging <laughs> me on a daily basis and telling me that I wasn't tough enough, wasn't playing well enough, wasn't going hard enough, wasn't preparing mm -hmm. right, that was Charlie Strong. He hmm. sharpened me, man. He was – nothing was ever good enough for him. He'd be out there working out and running with me. He'd get in the weight room, and he'd be like, come on, Carter. I'm a 40. I'm, I'm, I'm over 40. I'm hey, he still – hey, on, Charlie, Charlie looks like he still can put, pump it up yeah, for two man, now. I ain't going to lie. <laughs> so we, we had that atmosphere. At, at every yeah. turn, there was always someone to push you to make you better, and that was the environment. And, and, and that was the thing. If, if you can't stand the heat, don't go to a program like that. Don't, don't be in an environment where you're not trying to get it. Kev, you bring up a great point. I counted the other day. There were about 35 guys during the time, my four years at UCLA, myself included, Troy Eggman, you know, Marcus Patton, who I mentioned, that ended up playing in the league some way, shape, or form. Roman Pfeiffer. My mm -hmm. four years, there were about 35 guys that ended there. So the competition, what you're saying is true. In order for you to get on the field, I had to compete against James Washington every day or uh, – Eric Turner, I mean, mm -hmm. first round and third or fourth round draft picks that played a long time. How many guys from Florida were drafted in your four years that, that came out? How many, how many were uh, in the league or played, even a cup of coffee? Because yeah. was Chris Doring, I know you, Eric Reck, you talked about, Jason Odom. But the number of guys, I think when you, to your point, the competition has to be there for you to be a, a high level player if you want to be. We had so many guys that, 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 that played a long time and had a cup of coffee. I mean, we had everyone from, um, you know, the Mark Campbells and Reggie Greens of the world that were there for a little while. But we had guys like Ellis Johnson who played 10 years. That played he was with me and Indy. Yeah. Yeah. Tony, Tony we, McCoy. We had, yeah, Tony McCoy was there. Brad Culpepper was there. Yeah. Darren yeah. Mickle was there. I mean, oh. Ephesians Bartley, Tim Polk. Um, you know, Will White, uh, you know, we had, we had corner, our cornerbacks, we had, we had, we had guys, those were old school guys, the guys that came along with me. I mean, when I was a, when I was a senior, Fred Taylor, Jacquez Green, Reed L. Anthony, all came in as freshmen, you know what I'm saying? So it's like through, through the nineties, I mean, the caliber of player, Johnny Rutledge, Mike Peterson, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. Javon yeah. Kurtz, I mean. We had so many guys, and I think, and I think that was that was part of the allure, as you know. I mean, when when whenever you got a program where you got dudes that's going to the next level, you know, that's where that's that's what attracts those college those high school recruits. It's like because yeah. they want to go to a place that's going to sharpen them and make them viable for the next level. So we, yeah. we had we we had we had countless guys like that. I mean, there's just those guys, just to name a few. But I yeah. mean. It, everywhere you look, we had competition. Everywhere you looked, that there were yeah. guys trying to get there. The interesting thing is when they come back in the offseason and they tell you what it is, you then realize and you start to say, okay, I know I can play because I played against you and you're having mm -hmm. success or you know, you're coming back and we're still working out. Nothing has changed about you. I just need to now get myself to that level. Tell us about draft day. Uh, I think you were at the draft. Uh, uh, Paul yep. you know, getting yep. the jersey. Uh, yep. Kevin's looking. He ain't got his game face on, the sixth pick. So tell us a little bit what Justin Herbert, who was the sixth pick in this year, probably was thinking, even though he couldn't be in the, the audience. But being the sixth player picked in the NFL draft, what was that like for you today? You know, the, the, the thing that I realized quickly about possibly going that high in the draft is they're not drafting you to contribute. They're not drafting you just to come in and, and, and learn and, you know, kind of, kind of just be a guy that can develop over time. They're bringing you in to start. 
they're bringing you in to contribute. They're bringing you in because they think that you are an organization changing, building type player that they can win championships with. And that will go, we used to say that, you know, that kind of player that can go across that water, you know, go basically, <laughs> yeah. basically go to the Pro Bowl in yes. Hawaii. You know what I'm saying? If you're the type of guy that's going to get across that water someday, then yeah, that's why they're drafting you with those top 10 picks. And, and I'm sorry, the scrutiny is just different on you if, if, if you get taken that high. Because, look, the first thing is, you know, especially back in those days, you instantly made veteran money without having to prove that you were good enough to make veteran money. And, and that's the thing. So everybody in that organization is looking at you already. It's like, hmm. <laughs> what do we spend all this money on and are you worth it? So for me, for, for Justin Herbert, man, when you walk into that organization, the only thing that I would tell him is get your game face ready. Go in there with a chip on your shoulder, but go in there also humble and ready to learn more about your craft because you are nowhere near a finished product. I remember getting to, to, to training camp my first year there in St. Louis and I remember, I remember being in mini camp, and I was going against an undrafted free agent from No Name State. I ain't never heard of this guy before. He <laughs> hey, and that was two a days because if you were with Vermeil, y'all were doing two a days. It wasn't oh, yeah. uh, like walkthroughs in the morning, just <laughs> in the evening. It was two a days. Man. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so I'm there early, man, and this dude that I'd never heard of is kicking my butt every day in practice, mm. and I can't figure it out. I'm discouraged. I'm thinking they're going to start writing bad articles about me, about being a bust and everything else. But then, you know, one of the older guys, Sean Gilbert, Fred Stokes, pulled me aside and said, look, young buck, yeah. you better learn your craft, man. No matter how good you think you were on, on, on that level, this, the speed of this game is faster. The, the IQ, football-wise, yeah. of everyone around you is faster. It's a harder, more physical, more fast game that you have to think faster and be better. And, and that's what I, that's when I started realizing, okay, I had to take different, different aspects of my game and, and, and improve upon them. And so for him, when he first gets there, you know, he's going to throw picks. He's not going to make the quite, you know, the right reads. He's going to have people that resent him because he hasn't done anything and he's making more money than they are. You know, yeah. quarterbacks anyway in this world are going to get, you know, just rained upon with endorsements and everything else. So, but, 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 but make no mistake. If you're challenged, if, if you're Justin Herbert and you're feeling challenged right now and you're feeling like, hmm, I have a big, big, big challenge in front of me and there's something that I have to do and I got to improve, well, that's the right feeling to have because it's coming <laughs> and, and you know what? And all the media, none of the media is going to take it easy on you as far as your development and how quickly you learn this game. They'll respect you if you do like a Peyton Manning and you come in take your lumps, but you quickly improve. Yeah. You know, we all knew when we were sacking Peyton back in them days that that, that wasn't going to last long. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he has to be the same type of player. He's got to be that guy that, you know what, learn from your mistakes, take your lumps, and then come out there the next year and go 13-3. and three. No, Kevin, you bring up a really good point. There's two things that stood out to me. Everybody always asks about the speed of the NFL, and I tell them, you know, maybe you take a – you know, the fastest car you can think of, a muscle car, Camaro. And you think how fast it is and how much power it is. But when you think of the NFL from that speed to a Lamborghini or, or the highest power car, if you've ever gone to a, a NASCAR race and you feel the power of those engines and those yeah. cars, that's the NFL speed. And I mm -hmm. love it when I hear people talk about, oh, well, uh, you know, I could go out there and work out and be ready to play. No, you can't. I'm just no. Now, because some of the, the guys that, like, to your point, I can remember getting in the camp and going against Sam Mills, and I'm beating Sam Mills, right? I'm beating him. And, and we're in shorts, though. We're in shorts. Mm -hmm. This is in New right. Orleans. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I got to make the team. I got a ball because I'm a fifth-round pick. I don't know. I beat Sam once. He said, okay, bro, that's good, good job. Bro. Next time I beat him, and I swim him, I go bomb, catch the rock over the middle. Man, we don't have on pads. So if you do that again, I'm going to knock you in the next week. You know, and Sam said this, he was black. I thought he was joking. I'm like, oh, man, old man with these black. I went across the middle, KC. He hit me so hard, snot flying out my nose, helmet turned the other way. Then he comes over, Rook, I told you, if you keep doing that, I'm going to have to show you. It helps me up and says, when we put on the pads, you can do that. <laughs> Win these OTAs, 
this is my domain. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> to me, was a guy who was an undrafted free agent who played in the USFL, who became a Hall of Fame level guy because of what he could do. Yeah. Saying, Don't come in my turf. I'm going to let you play, play these little college games. But I'm going to show you what it's like. So... <laughs> That's I didn't really know the, the thing about the thing about the OTAs, you know, the organized team activities and many camps that I didn't realize is that I never I didn't think it was possible to go full speed without pads on. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was like, and, but, but that's when I realized there is a way to prepare that is on a higher technical mm-hmm. football IQ game. It's not about, look, all the linemen are coming off full speed, but it's yeah, all man. technique, hands, yeah. hand position, pad level. No one's no one's engaging their head, hitting people's at shoulders all. and everything else. It's all about being able to practice at a high level to see the looks you need to see in order to be effective on Sunday, but not beat your body up. And I didn't quite I didn't quite understand that. And that's something that, like I said, it comes with a great level of skill because you're gonna go, you're you're going, you're going nearly 90% of how fast you're gonna go. And Sam Mills told you, you know, he says, Hey, when we have on pads, certain things won't work. Because I'm going to do yeah. this or do this to you, and so you know, you, you, there's there's a way to prepare and there's a way to get better. But like I said, there's a there, there's a definite learning curve, man, from 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 one level to the next. Talk about that. You know, the person that I that I keep saying that is that I think is the most NFL ready of all yeah. the players yeah. that were drafted is uh, is your boy, man, Joe Burrow. You know, oh, yeah. yeah. The thing the thing that I realize and people say, well, he's not this phenomenal athlete, he doesn't have this phenomenal arm, he doesn't have, but, you know, he can make every throw on the offense and this and that, but people talk about how quickly and how fast he processes. Processes, And I'm like, that's the thing. I'm like, I saw him with non-superior athletic ability be the fastest, most effective player on the field in the Mm. biggest games they played. When I see him thinking and I see guys – the, the pocket collapsing on him, but they can't quite sack him because he's seasoned. He's he's yeah. three steps ahead of everyone on the field in terms of processing, which made him play faster on game day. To yeah. me, that's the most – talk about a quarterback. If you're going to talk about paying a quarterback, who can, who can make that transition? Show me their IQ. Show me their processing ability. Show me their ability to get themselves out of harm's way in order to be effective. And that's yeah. the one drawback I had on Tua Tunga Vailoa, man. Keep yourself out of harm's way. He's yeah, still fast yeah. and nimble in the pocket and got a rocket arm. But, man, he out of 24 games, 28 games in, in college, you, he had, what, four or five surgeries? That's yeah, a surgery yeah. every six or seven games, man. That's, <laughs> you know, you, you got to keep yourself healthy. So that the whole, the whole mental – like you said, going from a Camaro to a you know Lamborghini to a Formula One car, it's 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 it's, it's so much about the speed of the game. Yeah, you, you know, you bring up a good point. I, I want to talk to you about your Super Bowl year, and, and and we'll talk a little bit about some of these players that came out because the defensive line. Actually, before we go to you playing in the Super Bowl and that 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 run you had, I really want to ask you about some of these defensive linemen. I mean, I I think there were some really high level. Uh, defensive interior guys with some edge rushers as well. We, I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you your opinion on some of the top guys that you saw this mm-hmm. year and some of the higher draft picks from the defensive line position, especially interior or those edge rushers like you played. You, you were versatile enough to play both. But just kind of get your opinion on those those guys. Well, you know, Chase Young, of course, is the is the heir apparent. He, he's the one that, you know, is the prototype. And, Obviously, when you look at him from a from an ability standpoint, you know he has everything that checks off. But the thing I like about him the most, and people say, oh, you know, can he be as effective as the the Bosa brothers? And I'm like, well, the thing that I like about thing I like about Chase Young is he's bigger, stronger, and yeah. faster. He has more. Can I tell you one more. quick thing about Chase Young before you get into that? Mm-hmm. Larry and I were at dinner a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. and I was asking him, who are you know? You put out. Guy after guy after. He's a defensive line coach. Oh, yeah. Ohio State was at uh, Penn State, had a bunch One of guys. One of the in the country. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he he is a technician guy. He teaches these guys how to play. I said, Coach, I just want to get your opinion. Who is somebody that we haven't heard uh, that has come in and that you think will be the next great one in your, you know, your stable? Chase mm-hmm. Young. I said, well, 
don't know what he said, the MV, blah, blah, blah. But he said, this kid is going to be phenomenal. He's going to be one of my best ones ever if he just listens and does everything. You know how he talks. Mm-hmm. And I, it, it way, and, I, and when I hear people say, well, Chase Young doesn't do this, he doesn't do that, I'm going to go and listen to Larry Johnson or a guy like you that played 14 years because I see exactly what they're telling me. When you can get 17 sacks or however many sacks he had and miss two games or three games, Yeah, <laughs> that's a difference maker. So yeah, I just wanted to relay that story because it, it was awesome to hear him talk about the Bosa brothers and all of these other guys. Geno Atkins was at this dinner as well. Mm-hmm. And we're talking to Gino a little bit about pass rushing and technique because I'm, I'm an offensive guy. And luckily, as a tight end, I always have to help with the tackle. But I love right. to talk to them about what they have to do. So if I ever got – sometimes, it's Kev, I wake up and I'm still thinking I'm going to get up and I'm going to have to go take on you or Smith by myself. And I'm kind of <laughs> thinking, how do I do that? What, what steps do I have to have? What, what do I have to do? And I, and I have to wake up. My wife says, no, you, you're okay. They're not coming after you. <laughs> But yeah, but Chase, Chase Young is one. Uh, you know who who else in this draft of those top guys that you you liked when you were when you were looking at, at the draft prospects? I really really like Javon Kinlaw from South okay. Carolina. The more the more I watch him on film, the more I like. Um, everyone's you know was really excited about Derek Brown from Auburn, and and I mm-hmm. and I told people I'm like look. The thing about Derrick Brown, he's, he's everything you think he is, and he's going to be disruptive. But he was featured in Kevin Steele, the defense coordinator at Auburn's single-gap concept defense. You know, all he had to do was get wide in that, you know, three-technique, four-eye, and just wreak havoc. And, and, and it was set up for, for him to really be the disruptor and really do what he did best. Um, I think that may challenge him on the next level because – you know, teams aren't going to just let you, you know, get out there in a, in a wide, you know, three technique and just do that all day. They're, you know, they, they can account for that. And plus, you know, he'll, he'll see different schemes. So what's going to be required of him as far as from a football IQ standpoint won't be as straightforward as it was in college, which is why I like Javon Kinlaw. When I see Javon Kinlaw, he's a guy that is just scratching the surface on how good he can be. You know, he's so well, he's so well put together. Kid's an absolute monster. I mean, he's, he's not just a you know a, a, a run plugger you know type type player. He's he's a he's a, he's an all around kind of kind of guy. But the thing I like about him is he can two gap or he can play a single gap defense. And I saw him do more on film and have to do more quote unquote dirty work than okay. than 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 Derek Brown had to do. That's the thing that, that really intrigues me when I see players doing only one thing on film, and I see them you know being good and effective in only one way, you know, Derek Brown was effective and penetrating, but okay. holding the point, you know, basically and when, when they're running power down your throat, every play, you know, that, <laughs> that, 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 that you can't stop, you know, in, in the league, man, they're going to find out what plays work against your defense. And they're going to stay away from the things that you do well against them. You know, I, so I, I like those two guys. Um, I like Marlon Davidson uh, from, okay. from Auburn as well. I think he's a, he's a really good player. Um, the person that I was really intrigued with as far as an edge rusher, talking about – you talked about Penn State and Larry Johnson or whatever is reminiscent, but um, at Penn State, your tour gross matters. Yep. Okay, this uh, kid this kid is, is the guy – he turned my head after watching his combine film. Seeing okay. him, seeing him move, seeing him move through his drills, seeing how long he was, kind of reminds me of a Jason Pierre-Paul – Real kind of a lengthy mm. dude with long arms, and you know, two hundred seventy-five pounds right now. You know, six five. He doesn't. You know, he doesn't look like that. When I look at him, and I saw him the same thing. When I watched him on tape, I'm thinking, man, he doesn't look two seventy-five. Right. But he, but he plays with a certain, uh, and it's hard to get your hands on him. I mean, I was that's a- the kind of guy that. That's the kind of guy to me, though. The kind of guy that doesn't look like that, that carries that kind of size. Mm-hmm. He'll put on ten to twenty more pounds. And and watch out. He he's a guy that if he learns to use himself, learns to really use those arms and that push pull. I mean, he's a guy that I just like what he does, and I, and I think he's just scratching the surface. I mean, talk about production in college. I think he had eighteen and like maybe eighteen and a half sacks in his in his in his in his last two years there at Penn State. Just scratching the surface. A guy that can get a lot better, but. That's the thing. I mean, you know, there are players in this draft that will go free agents that will be Hall of Famers. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, there's, yeah, you know, true. We're always looking for the guy that, that has the just the, you know, the ceiling or has the potential to be better than, than what they were picked. 
your tour gross matos went high enough, but I think he's someone that can really be a good player that we haven't really talked about. Now you talk about you guys with the Super Bowl year. Just tell us about that because that was, I mean, it was year for you. Uh, I think you know, just looking back at it, I can even remember you, you guys were the greatest show on turf. But yeah, mm -hmm. London Fletcher, Mike Jones, Mike Jones, <laughs> Mike was, Jones. <laughs> yeah, I think my buddy Ro was Roman on that team too. Yeah, Roman. Roman wasn't. Roman left the year before. Right. He left yeah, the year before. Yeah, heartbroken man. Yeah, he, he was the one to help us build that man. <laughs> yeah. But, but but he got his ring in the, in the New England. And, yeah, fight a new fight was there with you guys at that, at a certain point. But but a lot of discussion about your offense, and there was a, not a lot of talk about how good that defense was. And I think I yeah. could, you know just doing some research before we got on uh, today, the saltiness of all you guys on the defensive side, and it took the defense to actually win the game at the very end, which I always thought yeah. was out, you know was was the part that I really loved about that team. I think Marshall there as well, who you and I and, and a lot of people think have some, you talk about football IQ, one of the smartest guys from a football oh. standpoint that I've ever been around, quarterbacks, right. uh, coaches, whatever. He's one of those guys. Tell me about that magical year you guys had at St. Louis and, and winning a Super Bowl. Well, as you know, you know, the magic you see from one season isn't just about that one season. Um, no. Dick Vermeil, Dick Vermeil came in, um, you know, two years prior to that, three years prior to that. And he told us, he says, in three years, we'll be world champs. He told us that. And he said that at the press conference. And, of course, you've got all the media members and, you know, everybody thinking, okay, whatever. This guy's, you know, <laughs> lost his mind. You know, yeah. and he, you know, he brought back, you know, Jim Hannafin and yep. Frank Gans and all these old coaches out of retirement, yeah, like yeah. White. Carl, Big Daddy, Harrison, all, I mean, just a bunch of, bunch of old guys on the staff that hadn't coached, you know, in a couple of years. And, man, he assembled his all-star cast, and he told us, he says, man, if you look to the left and look to the right, that guy may not be here when we win, when we hold that trophy up. He says, make mm -hmm. sure you are. Make sure that you can challenge yourself to make the commitment to be a part of something special because it's not going to be easy. And he was right. And you talk about them two-a-days and practices that Vermeil puts you through. I mean, it, it was it was hell, man. It was you know two three hour practices in pads during training camp, stuff that you weren't by NFLPA regulations, you weren't really supposed <laughs> to be able to do. You know, the, the rules know, were starting to rules were just starting to change in the early nineties. You remember? I, I, I'll tell you one thing about Dick Vermeil. He was a UCLA guy, but mm -hmm. he uh, and then he he also I can remember when he left and went to the Eagles, talked a lot about. Uh, not doing everything he could have done to help that team when he had them too tight. You know, they, they got mm -hmm. Super Bowl they played. What, you, you can go back and revise history. But I think he always told me when I would ever see him at UCLA or when he was around, I made sure the next time or if I ever get that chance again, I won't work those guys quite like I did when we get later in the season. Now, me and Jim Moore, who I played for in St. Uh, New Orleans, they were the same way. I can remember Jim Moore. We, we had – Eight straight days or two a days, my first week in, in camp with pads, all pads. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I, I didn't think there was light at the end of the tunnel. My body was so sore. I didn't know I had parts that could get that sore. And right. <laughs> the same, they were from the same school of. We're going old school. Jim was a, a marine, former marine. I know Dick. As 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 much as he would cry, you'd be like, man, I wish you would cry like that when I'm hurting because you right <laughs> you can turn it on, but you're hurting me. And and I, it's interesting to watch the progression of how his career came, and then he changed up to give you guys that offensive firepower, but also the defense, he, defensive guy. Even though he loved good offense as well. Yeah, we got there. The thing about you know our defensive standard basically came from day one. And we had a lot of prideful guys on defense. I mean, we had myself, DeMarco Farr, like you said, Roman Pfeiffer. We had Todd Light, you know, at one corner. We had uh, Keith Lyle. We had Toby Wright. I mean, we had a lot of guys that, that had a lot of pride and played and really tried to hold uphold the standard of, you know, no matter – even if we were losing on the field, you know, if, if the scoreboard didn't reflect it, we were going to leave our mark on you. You were going to remember – that you played against the Rams defense and you were going to respect us. You know, it's like you can, you can be the 49ers and talk all this crap or whatever, but man, I'm going to sack you, Steve Young. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm, I'm, I'm Derek Deese, all you guys up front. I'm, I'm, I'm beating all you guys up front. Um, you know, Brent Jones, Brent Jones, I'm a ragdoll. You, you, you try to, try to block me on, on the run block, 
you know, and so we, we had that chip. And so, so those first two years with Vermeil was all about us spent just getting hungry and getting pissed off because mm. we, we knew we were better than, 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 than what the scoreboard reflected. And, and that was the thing. He was, he, he was tuning us and getting us ready and, and getting the offense where it needed to be. And both those seasons that we had, I mean, there was a stretch where we lost like six or seven games straight. I mean, it was just really, really hard. And I mean, guys were on the edge, on the brink of, you know, just basically a, a mutiny, you know, saying because we were practicing so hard and it seemed like it was counterproductive and, you know, but he was building something. He had a he had a vision for the toughness and for the for the the lack of concern for ourselves and putting the team first. That you know, that buy in factor that we just didn't have. I mean, he knew in his heart what it took to win a world championship, and 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 he was going to get it no matter what. And and that was the thing. I mean, talk about having a coach that nothing was ever good enough, you know. But like I said, he was building. We drafted guys. You know, we drafted Orlando Pace. We drafted Grant Wistrom. We were adding pieces here and there. But then that third year is when everything kind of came together. We had gotten a guy by the name of Kurt Warner from, you know, the, the Arena League, and he was a second-string quarterback, um, third-string quarterback that was running our scout team. So I remember, I remember in the mini camps, we had signed Trent Green. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Trent Green came in. We had we had Marshall Falk, we had Isaac Bruce, we had Tory Holt, we had Ricky Prohl, we had Tony Horn, we had Oz Akeem. I mean, we had weapons, man, on offense. And and then, you know, there was this guy that was on the scout team that was just killing us. And it was this quarterback that just did not miss. And I'm sitting there yelling, getting into arguments, getting in fights with Todd Light, with T Light and them in the back end. I'm like, man, we having to repeat plays over and over because you guys can't you know he's like man brother don't he don't miss he ain't got the best deep ball in the business and and so we knew that kurt was was capable you know even back then but then that summer man you know going through many camps and seeing our offense just completely transform we were excited but the, the magic didn't really take place until we got to training camp we got to training camp and it was the same old for meal you know, barbarianism, you know, camp mm. that we were going through. I'm talking, I go over to individual, man, and Big Daddy Carl Harrison, he was like, he'd be in a bad mood every day. He'd be like, you know what? We ain't tough enough. We ain't coming up all like we should. So, you know what we're going to do during individual? We're going to do up-downs. We're going to do up-downs and the individual. And then, of course, you know, the linemen are always the furthest away. From, from everything. So we'd have to, the horn would blow after doing up downs for 10 straight minutes. We'd have to run over to 907 and, and, and go in there and compete and get yelled at because we're getting blown off the ball because we're all gassed <laughs> from doing up downs. That was the type of barbarianism that we were going through, man. And, and I remember, and, it, and I was like, this is, I, was, I, I finally had to tell myself, this is not to, to, to build any kind of football IQ. This is about building toughness. This is about building want to. This is about building an esprit de corps. This is about basically selling out, saying, I'm going to hold my gap if you hold your gap. This is about getting everyone on the same page. And he knew what he was doing. So we were going through the same barbarian training camp and about halfway through, but it was a magical, magical day, okay? Man, we, you know, we get out there and it's the same old thing. And about halfway through practice, guys are just, you know, you, you have that permanent headache that you got during <laughs> training camp, that headache that just don't go away. You know what I'm saying? That, that headache just, and you just, we're there and it's 100 degrees and we're, we're in Western Illinois University campus in the middle of nowhere, cornfields and just, and he calls us up in the middle of practice and starts to cry like, like, like like somebody just shot his dog. I mean, he's crying uncontrollably on the 50-yard line of the field, and we don't know what's going on because we're, we're, we're gassed in practice. And he says, you guys are finally ready. You've made the commitment, and now, he says, you understand what it takes to win a world championship. He says, we're ready, guys. We're going to change practice. Up. We're going to change the way we do things. We're going to do it. You're going to see, and you'll be excited. He's like, I want everyone off the field right now. Take it in. Take it in, hit the showers, and he says, we have, a, we have a little team gathering set up 
at the Purple Pride, and Purple Pride was this little little dive bar on the edge of campus, <laughs> and and basically we went there, and this 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 straight lace stuffy old man like staff that we had, we yeah. had strippers, we had beer, <laughs> we had pizza. We had not a, for a meal. <laughs> I mean, it was it was like a party. I'm like, man, what is going on? The next day, we were in shorts. We were in shorts wow. and those little, those, those little, you know, mini <laughs> like upper pads, <The> spiders. <laughs> yeah, little spider pads. That's all we had on. And man, and we were all looking at around each other. We we're like, hey, man, don't mess this up. You know, we were all because we were scared because we were like, man, this is going to revert back at any time. But man, we went out there and we practiced with that tempo. We practiced with that attention to detail where no one dropped the pass. Every hand placement was right. Every time we came off, our pad level was right. And everyone finished every rep to the echo of the whistle. We found that esprit de corps. Through our preseason games, we were blowing people out. Our offense was looking magnificent. And then, of course, that fateful preseason game against the San Diego Chargers where mm. Rodney Harrison – <laughs> Rodney, to this day, to this day, Rodney, I, man, I, I really have, I have mixed feelings about Rodney Harrison. I, I respect him and love him as a brother and everything. He's a good dude. But, man, I still have a sore spot just because because he hurt my quarterback, Trent Green. But, you know, blessings are curses. No man can say. It's all in what you do with it. And we had another guy sitting at number two that no one knew about. And, of course, mm -hmm. the rest is history. I know our coach for came on television and said, we will rally around Kurt Warner. We will play good football, that famous speech. And I remember being on the phone with my dad <clears throat> and my dad's like, man, what's coach for talking about, man? He's talking about well, you guys, you guys going to play good football. He's like, man, we can't win if we ain't got Trent. I'm like, dad, I'm like, Kurt Warner is pretty good. I'm like, we're going to be okay. And of course the rest is history, but you know, talk about building something yeah. we were building and we were building it when we were losing, we had a guy named Frank, Frank Gans, God rest his soul. Frank Gans was our special teams coach. He was a former fighter pilot, you know, in the Navy. He was, he was a historian. He was an attorney, just a well-versed Renaissance man. He told the most fascinating, magnificent stories of war, of, of, of historical warfare that one could ever hear. Told us the Battle of the Bulge, the Battle of Wake Island, D-Day all types of historical quotes told us about how Genghis Khan trained the Huns army. I mean, and we were, and he basically had us convinced that we, and he, this is the way he said it. This is his words, not mine. He says, we are elite warriors on the threshold of greatness. He said, it doesn't matter unless it matters to you. He says, what we're doing here is just playing football. But if you bring deeper meaning to what you're doing, young men, on a daily basis, it will mean more. And he says, the memories and the championships you build and win will last you a lifetime. I mean, that's, that's how he spoke. So even if you weren't even on special teams, you went to the meetings. Yeah. I mean, our yeah. whole team, Kurt Warner, Marshall <laughs> Falk, everybody is sitting there glued to their seat to wait to see what C Coach Frank Gans is going to bring us. Coach Vermeil brought in Joe Frazier. He brought in Layla mm. Ali. He, he brought in all these historical figures that had done great things just, just to impart their wisdom on, upon, upon us. We had more guest speakers and people, friends of the program yeah. coming in. It was really a magical time. And they say it means more as you get away from it. And they're right because we built a, a special memory, man, that when I see those guys, it's something that no one will ever be able to take away. And if you've ever been a part of a championship run like that, man, it's, it's special. It's unlike anything else. Yeah. I always tell people that um, I always like to hear their stories because it, it, it takes you back to that. You know, as, as I say, so often the memories we have, we start thinking about it and we go into ourselves and it tells you, and it, and it gives you encouragement when times get tough. But I'll tell you one thing about Kurt Warner. I was in Green Bay as a free agent uh, trying to make their team. He was behind mm -hmm. Brett Favre, Mark Brunel, Ty Turner, and I, I played a lot of catch with him. I got to know Kurt just a little bit during that time. And when he came in, I told people, I said, this guy's going to be fine. I think if they can hold up and play with the guys you guys have offensively and I knew Marshall, uh, I didn't know you, but I knew your, your talent. And I know, you know, watching you guys and speaking to Roman about the team, knowing what you guys were going to be able to do. That was so impressive.
But I think you're right. I think when we hear now all these coaches that bring in great speakers, they know that you got to be one. Uh, football is one sport that uh, you can talk about basketball or baseball, but in football, you got to have 22 or 53 or 100 guys all moving in the same direction. Even if they're not on the field, everybody plays a, a significant role. Everybody, the trainers. It, it just, when you have those magical seasons, that's why everybody gets a ring. I don't care who it is. Yeah. In the, in that program, they get a ring because they played yeah. a role in you getting to that, that level. So I, I agree with you. That's, it's, a, it's, it's magical. You played 15 years in the league. You got to win a Super Bowl. What was it like, the transition? I always ask guys when they transition from the game. You played a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. Some guys have regrets. They play 18 years. Or some guys say, you know, I wish I could have had more. What was, what was it like for you? the day after you retired and say, I need to now move to this next phase of my life. You know, it, it, it's funny. It's like um, people, you know, you, we, we walk away from the game the way we walk away from the game. And it's not always pretty. And sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an injury that ends your career. Sometimes it's, you know, you get in a space where you just can't compete. You know, there's all, there's, there's different things that, that humble you and, and take you out of the game. For me, I, I was I was really blessed. I was fortunate, man, that you know it wasn't an injury. It was it was just time, you know. And it wasn't and and I and I felt good. I still I felt like I had ball in me still, and and I still was asked to play. I mean, I, I went and visited, you know, Belichick, you know, and and I wasn't gonna go see him. I, I said, ah, nah, I don't like. <laughs> hey, get back to I New England. Know. Remember, Richard Seymour was the guy we couldn't remember, but he had a great. Yes. So, and I, when I, I could see him actually playing. I'm like, I don't know what that was talking about. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, you went to Seymour. That's the, that's the Javon Kinlaw comparison. <laughs> um, but see, at, at, at that point, funny, funny we bring him up because at that point, Richard Seymour had left and gone to Oakland. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, and so he was looking, Belichick was looking for another elder statesman guy who could, who could put his hand on the ground and play one of those big, you know, four eye, five technique, defensive end, just kind of be a guy that had a high football IQ, didn't make any mistakes, and could hold a point and do all those things. So he so he wanted me to come in and play. Offered me a two year deal, man, you know, three million a year. I mean, it just guaranteed it was a good deal at that point in my career. And I still could have gone on and played and, and made it sixteen years. My heart wasn't in it. You know, every time I I, I changed teams when I walked into that new locker room, I had a chip on my shoulder and I, I had that attitude like, okay, I know you guys don't necessarily know me. You, you see me on film, you know my reputation, but let me show you why I make more money than you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so I always had that, I, I was ready for that challenge walking into that new locker room, but I wasn't there, my heart wasn't in it. And, and, and playing that long, being healthy, I never once thought about my safety. I never thought about what I was doing in my body. I never thought about, you know, man, you know, am I going to be able to walk or what am I doing in my back? Is my head going to be okay? You know, these, these concerns are in the back of every player's mind. Okay. Don't, yeah. don't get me wrong. You can be, you have to put it, you have to put it on the shelf because you can't go out there scared. You can't go and you can't not put yourself, you know, completely 100% in harm's way and expect to, you know, to, to be successful. So, but I'd never thought about, you know, my mortality or, or, or being hurt or injured like that before. I thought about it then, you know, it was a time in my life, man, where I had, I had a nine year old son and, and he was, and he was saying, daddy, I want to play, I want to play travel baseball, you know? And, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I, I, I can get him lessons or get someone to work with him or whatever, but you know, he wanted me, you know, he, he, he wanted me to work with him. And, and it was more about a time in my life where I made a decision to walk away from the game on my own terms and and that was a that was a hard thing to do but it was a very satisfying move on my part being that i still felt like i had ball in me i physically i was, I was healthy i could still go but to make that decision to turn the page and go into the next chapter i think kind of helped me now as far as the transition bro like it's hard for all of us okay I don't care, like you said, if you played one year or 50 years in the league, whether you won, you know, six NFL, you know, world championships or, you know, you, you barely had a cup of coffee, you miss the game. You miss the guys. You miss the locker room. You miss the camaraderie. You miss being a part of something. 
you also, if you play long enough, like we talked about, man, there's ways where, that you haven't developed yourself off the field that all of your peers that are in the business world have. They've been working and interning and, and building and buying and selling companies and, and transitioning through jobs and dealing with HR and everything else. You know, a lot of us don't have those skills, man. It's a scary, scary thing to be looking at retirement. You know, some, sometimes it's a monetary thing. Sometimes you say, man, how am I going to make money? For me, I was blessed. I played a long time. I saved my money. But for me, it was about what kind of contribution am I going to be able to give to this world as a 38-year-old man who's never done anything but play ball, you know? And so I had to rediscover who I was and what kind of contribution I could make to this world. And, man, in that process, bro, it's hard. It's yeah. hard. There's a lot of soul searching. Man, I was, I was up every morning trying to make lunch for my son <laughs> and trying to be this dad extraordinaire, trying to do all these honeydews. And my wife finally came to me and told me, she's like, you got to go to work. She's like, <laughs> you, you got to find something to do. You, you got to find stuff. She's like, you have too much, yeah. you know, of this, of this type A, you know, alpha male, whatever energy that you got, you got to go out and be a leader and do something. You got to, you got to reforge and rediscover that. So for all of us, man, rediscovering is a hard process, but it's one that it's possible to do. Like you, like like you know, if you go ahead and put your nose to the grindstone and figure yeah. it out, and, yeah. and so that's go ahead. Yeah. And, that, and that's the process that I had to go through. I you know went to work for a social networking company, started yeah. doing some broadcast, started doing some radio. You know, started looking into selling insurance. I was looking at a company. I was looking at possibly selling you know turf field turf fields to high school oh, yeah. I remember I, mean, I was looking into I was looking into all types of stuff man just just feeling it out just seeing where I would find my you know my my niche and um and I you know thankfully I found it in broadcasting but but, but man that transition from from you know after football is a, is a hard thing it's just something that I'm, I'm I'm grateful now that there's a lot more programs and, and things in place as to where guys like me and you we reach back and we help those guys transition and we help them because we, you know, help them realize their own potential. And, but yeah, that's a, that, that's a, that's a hard transition and it's not to be taken lightly. But for me personally, it was one that, you know, thankfully um, got eased in the transition. But the biggest thing that eased that in that transition was family. Yeah. Redefining myself, man, as a, as a father, recommitting myself to being a good dad, and, you know, I went and bought a bucket of balls and a net and everything else. And I was, you know, doing soft toss and throwing BP and, you know, giving my son grounders and pop flies and everything and, and, and coaching his teams and getting involved in his life and, and being a husband. That's 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 what saved me, man. That's that's what brought me out of that dark cloud space that I was in after after retiring from the league. You know, it's interesting to hear your story. And um, I, I thank you for sharing it because that's the one thing I tell people I can remember. Uh, when I knew it was time for me to walk away, so to speak. I kept, you know, I was injured most of my career, but I played. I was able to do that and kind of play on one and a half leg. But I can remember working out with the Panthers. And after you finished, they, they put you on the bus. Andre Reed and I were heading off back to the airport, and I had a bucket of uh, Bojangles chicken. Mm -hmm. The chicken, didn't really want to eat it because I didn't have that appetite anymore. And I just said, I knew in my heart of heart I had to leave. I, was, I, I have to find that next thing because I'm not going to keep chasing it here. And to your point, it was some dark, dark times for me. I can remember in 96, 97, laying on my office floor thinking, would my family be better here without me or should I stay here? I mean, right. it, was, it was like that for me. And I, and I knew I didn't go get a gun or do anything, but I had that thought. And that's mm -hmm. what it was a dark place. I talk to guys all the time now. I said, look, you got to find you something. If you need a friend, I don't care what time it is, you call me. Because yeah. I know that time and that place and those, the demons that, because to you, to, to us, locker room is what you miss the most. I miss, I miss playing football. I, I'll miss mm -hmm. that till I die, but I miss the guys. I miss the, the guys. The, the, the camaraderie, all of those things. Yeah, when you hear guys go through that transition or they do, some of the things that, you know, our, uh, we know Junior Seau or Dave Durson, you just wish that there was somebody there maybe or, or that could just have helped them through that. Not that's yep. not, it's fraternity. I agree with you. There are more things in place and more uh, opportunities for guys not to have to go through that alone.
I will brag all day long on the things that we've been able to accomplish through my foundation. And this was the first step in creating my legacy. When I think about it, it makes me laugh. What a difference that a couple of years can make. Four years out of my life here in Tennessee, I am forever changed. My perception went from being someone who was a problem guy to being basically the poster child for what is truly the consummate NFL professional. I am so <clears throat> so, Kev, as you transition, you talk about it. Thanks for sharing that story, but you also do a lot now, uh, Waiting for Wishes, uh, through your foundation, the Kevin Carter Foundation, that you and your wife and your family have set up. I think it's great. I've had a chance to go and spend time there two years. Uh, I got to sing with some country music stars. <laughs> on tables with actors and actresses and it's just a football player. I mean, we're all there as a group and it's hard to describe the people until they go and, and see what you and Jay DeMarcus are doing there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I think it's a great, great event and I think more people need to know about that. Yeah, it's, um, you know, this year would have been our 19th annual Waiting for Wishes Celebrity Waiters Dinner. Um, you know, I, I tell people, um, you know, I, I look at my 19 year old son and that's how long this event has been, you know, in existence, started it back in 2001 when I was playing for the Tennessee Titans. And, you know, the thing about starting an event like this, it, you know, it, it's grown into something that basically I played 14 years in the league, but this thing has been going on for 19 years. That's just how powerful it is. I only, I only played four of my 14 years, um, in the league in, in Nashville, but setting this this magical event up like you said i mean it's it's really been a blessing for so many people um basically man when i got to when i got to, to, to nashville tennessee i had done um I, I did something similar to it back when i was playing for the rams and but it wasn't my event it was it was dan deardorff and jim hart's event and um they did it at their restaurant and they had a bunch of the old you know cardinals cardiac cardinals out there playing you know <laughs> serving and waiting tables and and us rams got to come in and kind of hang out you know, with Ozzy Smith and all those guys. And, and we basically served dinner and, and did a bunch of skits and hand it up and everything. And I said, man, this is, this is a, this is a very unique concept. And so when I went to um, the Tennessee Titans as a free agent, I said, man, I've got to make my mark in this community. How can I do it? And I thought of that event and about four years into its, its existence, you know, we had just been doing it with, with Titans players and people like that. And then we branched out with you know my my golfing buddy who was in Rascal Flats, you know, Jay Marcus. <laughs> yeah. And and he brings, I mean, he brings just a whole new level of star power to that event. And we started having actors and actresses and UFC fighters and comedians and just people from all walks of fame. And and it's grown into what you see now. And like you know, I mean we have, you know, 50 plus celebrities there in the same room <clears throat> and they're all humbling themselves and taking selfies and you know, taking personal videos and singing yeah. and acting out and doing things. And then afterwards we have an after party, you know, where everybody gets up on stage. I mean, to see, you know, to see, you know, Rick Springfield singing up there when he's got Tommy Thayer, the lead, lead guitar <laughs> from Kiss, and he's got Joe Don Rooney from Rascal Blast playing another guitar. You got, you know, Jason Fitz playing a fiddle, you know, and you got, you know, Jay, Jay DeMarcus on the keyboard. And, you know, you have all these people that are collaborating and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that the Kevin Carter Foundation has been able to give close to $3 million through this one night a year for the last 19 years. So this COVID-19 um, pandemic has, has stopped us from doing it this year. We've rescheduled it to July 20th. Hopefully you can make it down, Buck. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I've got to I mean, it on the calendar. I told Stephanie. Yeah wife I, we, we talked about it and she hasn't been able to come but i said you gotta come it, it's, oh yeah it, it's a great event and uh the, the singing that i've done there i've been i've had a couple of adult beverages while i've done those uh, <laughs> yeah. I, and i hope the video doesn't surface anywhere but it's been fun because you know those guys all those mu country music singers will try to get you on stage which i think right is, i mean it's just it's a great time for people to uh, you know, share and, and get to know each other. And like you said, you start to build bonds with people you don't know, but you've seen them in different things. And the, what, what I found about music and entertainment and sports, we all want to do 
what the other one's doing. Like we all exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly. that's the beauty of having gone to school in LA. You, you played, you know, and then playing in the league, and you're the same way. Getting a chance to be around these guys, Nashville has just become a mecca for uh, not just country music, but music in general. I think they've they've been able to do that better than almost anybody. Yeah, and the thing about and the thing about for for me personally, it's something that. You know, talk about making your mark and, and and leaving a legacy. You know, as a as a human being, regardless of, of of what you've done on the field. For me, it was about establishing a legacy, something that I could give back. Because you know, you you, you play ball, you're blessed with this platform, and and what you know, what what we've been able to create through that event is something that hopefully inspires others, especially a lot of these young kids coming out. Man, they have such thunder. They have such star power, you know, man, use, use what God has given you, create something, create a lasting legacy that will continue to give back. Even, even when you're, when you got gray in your beard and you, <laughs> and you, and you reminiscing with your homeboy about, you know, what you did back in the nineties, you know, in this game, you know, you have something that still stands longer than, 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 than what you've done. So I'm, I'm thankful for that. So we've, we've, we've done a great job. It's a great event partner with Make-A-Wish Middle Tennessee Legacy PR and Events. There, Teresa Halbrooks and her staff do a wonderful job. And we're 19 years in the making, man, trying to make it 20. Well, before I let you go, I'll, I'll also say, too, I mean, we've gotten to know each other. It's almost like a brother from another mother. I'm only child. So, uh, you know, growing up uh, around your boys, you kind of gravitate to certain people. And I'll just say this, you were really instrumental in helping me kind of not just think about starting what I've been doing here in Charlotte, with the, which is the Carolinas Senior Football Showcase. You got a chance to come, uh, you know, mm-hmm. but what it is is just designed to help those high school football players that don't have an opportunity just get to college. But it's interesting, not just you, but another guy from Florida, Mo Collins, kept telling me, "If you can't yeah. about this, I, I am going to hurt you. Just do it." You know, Mo uh-huh. has passed away, so. It, mm-hmm. It's always funny, the, the, the degrees of separation with people and uh, how small the circle of guys is. But it's always great to hear stories because, you know, so often we get on 10-minute clips or three-minute clips and don't get to talk. And I'm glad you were able to come in and just share some things with us. This has been great. I mean, there's some things I've learned about you that I even didn't know <laughs> why you were and, and what made you tick and what makes your heart trigger your head more so than your head triggering your heart. So. Thank you for, for, for coming out today, man. We had a great time talking. And any parting words for you, anything else? I know you want young guys to, 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 to really make their mark. But what about these uh, other NFL guys that are getting drafted or anything that, that you know, uh, last-minute parting shots from you? Man, I, the, the advice that I would give to anybody coming into the league is realize that you are privileged and you are blessed to become a part of a great fraternity of great men that have come before you. You stand on the shoulders of those giants who came before you. You stand on the shoulders of people who have paved the way. Know your history, take your time, come in, learn your craft and humble yourself and get better. That is the only way that you're gonna have one of those long tenured careers is if you concentrate and learn your craft. Man, you know, the thing I I tell young guys all the time is like, it doesn't matter where you came from. Okay, you can come from the, the worst surroundings or the worst circumstances, but you have the power within your hands to erase the family curse that is in your family. You have the power in your hands to make sure your kids go to private schools for the rest of their life and, you know, and, and, and not on free lunch. You've got the power to rewrite what would have been your future. You know, don't waste it. Don't waste it. There's so much that you have in there and, and, and just not within the game there's a mark you can leave on our society. There's a, you've been given a platform with which you can transform everything that's been written about you and rewrite what's going to come. So don't waste that's great, it. Man. Good. Hey, one last thing. What instrument did you play in the band? <laughs> I played saxophone. Oh, play saxophone. Yeah. And if you, that's, if, that's why. If you do some, if you do some digging, you might see me playing a national anthem on my saxophone back in 2003 in oh. um, Buffalo preseason game for the Tennessee Titans. Man, so, I look for that. I didn't just, see that. Just one. Been I, putting it out there. I, I, okay, we got to put that one on. That's why I had to ask the question. I'm thinking 
What did he play? Because you know what? It makes sense now. Anytime we would be in the studio late at night, you would start singing something, and I would start singing something. And it was yep. plays those songs back in the 80s where they had that one sax riff. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, it was the old school uh, Temptations. I know you want to leave. <laughs> and I refuse to <laughs> let you go. Yep. And then it came to the locker room. We had, we had people on set singing with us. Like, y'all got to do that again. Every, every time we worked together, we just started. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that you see that, that that that's that love of music, man. I, I had that. Yeah. I had that in me from from, from an early age. Yeah. So. Well, man, I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. It's been great talking to you. Say hello to your wife and family, and we'll do it again, man. This is this has been great. Thanks for having me. Tell Steph I said hello, man. Let's 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 cue it up and do it again soon. All right. Thanks, Casey. Appreciate All it. All right.